Hi, good afternoon. <laughs> Save your applause. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here with you this afternoon. I hope this is going to be a really interesting talk. Um, I don't have any financial disclosures, sadly. So I like to, let's get everybody together by talking about a case, right? Who doesn't start a talk with a case? It's 2 p.m., you're about ready to wrap up a busy shift and you have a two-week-old that pops up on your board and you see a frustrated mom dragging herself in with her two-week-old infant. The child's been vomiting and not gaining weight very well. Mom's getting very frustrated. She looks terrible. Baby looks terrible. Just kidding. Noisy breathing at night is her main concern. Child's not growing and, the, and her baby has noisy breathing. What do you do for that patient? What is your diagnosis? How do you manage them in the emergency department? How do you talk to mom and how do you get them home? Totally different scenario from the five o'clock, oh no, help my baby, where mom brings in her three-year-old who's in sudden respiratory distress. They've had URI symptoms for a few days, but now things have changed and the child comes in with a fever to 101. They have a little bit of strider, but honestly, they're just squeaking. This child is sitting upright, anxious, sniffing position, sats are 90%. Slightly different scenario. So when you think about these cases, you can, you can really get lost in your thought process. You start to think, are they sick? Are they not sick? What is my differential? Who am I going to call? What if this child needs an airway? What if this is a foreign body? Do I examine him? Do I irritate this one? Do I not irritate this one? You can get sort of lost in your, in your thought process. And like many times when we get lost in our thought process, what seems like a really good idea for an approach ends up getting you stuck and not getting the result that you're really looking for. So the goals of this talk are to talk about the, how, you, how you address the child who comes into your emergency department with noisy breathing. The first things that you must ask yourself is where is the problem, because that is going to dictate exactly what you do when they're in the ED with you that day, and is this a recurrent problem or an acute first-time problem? That is, these are the two biggest questions you have to ask yourself every time you see a child with noisy breathing. We're going to talk about the things that cause noisy breathing in childhood, maybe things that you thought about way back when, but it's been a long time since anyone's mentioned a word with the term malacia after it, and it kind of makes you seize internally. And then we're going to talk about what to do in the oh no scenario, because that's the one that no matter where you practice, whether it's a children's hospital with everybody at your disposal, or a remote location where you are the only one, this always makes people nervous. The world can be divided into two types of ED doctors, right? Those who've had the pediatric airway disaster and those who will, and it always makes us nervous. So location, location, location. This, this is actually pretty fascinating because you can tell where the problem is just by watching the child as you, as you walk into the room. And it's all physics, which I didn't really enjoy the first time, so I'm not going to bore you with. If it's inspiratory strider, the problem is above the vocal cords. It's a <coughs> Try it when you get back to your hotel room. You'll see. That's, oh, that's above my vocal cords. Interesting. There's not very many things that cause inspiratory strider, especially harsh inspiratory strider. And the one that you have to be most scared of is a foreign body, because a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today, you don't have to do much. This, this will resolve on its own with some calm approach, some analgesia, some treatment of fever, some steroids. But if you have a foreign body above the level of the vocal cords, you cannot just put that patient in the back of an ambulance and send them somewhere, because that foreign body is going to move right down into the airway as soon as you put that kid in the back of an ambulance and they start bouncing towards the children's hospital. So if you hear harsh inspiratory strider and you're worried about a foreign body, that's when you can start constricting your own airway. Um, inspiratory strider under any other circumstances is usually fairly benign. Biphasic, the kind of the Darth Vader approach, the that's right at your vocal cords. I know you're all going to do this when you get back today. I know. So right at the glottic region, and it's, or a little bit below it. So we're going to talk about the things that can cause subglottic or glottic region uh, strider, because these are things that sound really impressive, but you might not want to get too invested in in the emergency department. And the last is expiratory. If it's expiratory, it's coming from in the chest area, subglottic region. It's, uh, right, something is constricting the trachea underneath, under, um, underneath the vocal cords. So we talked about location that you can tell just by listening to the child as you walk into a room. You can start to make, build your differential in a logical fashion. The other question is, is this insidious onset and recurrent, or is this an acute process? If it's insidious onset, think structural. And that is in your favor, because if it's structural, it didn't just pop up yesterday. So yesterday the kid was fine, today the kid is not. If it's a structural problem, something might be aggravating it, but you don't want to jump in there. You don't know what that airway looks like. Maybe they have subglottic stenosis and they have a tight little airway. Now they have a cold and it's worse. 
but I'm going to show you some pictures of subglottic stenosis, and you don't want to, and you don't want to intubate that child at all. I don't want to intubate that child. Nobody wants to intubate that child. So don't just do something. Stand there for a minute. Calm the child down. Give them steroids. Give them an analgesics. Give them antipyretics. Keep them calm. If it's acute onset on the other side, on the other hand, and they've never had this before, and all of a sudden they come into you and they they have noisy breathing, you want to think infection or foreign body, and now you better be prepared to act fast. And by being prepared to act fast, you have to know ahead of time exactly what you're going to do. Can, do you know right now sitting here where your pediatric McGills are in case someone comes in with a foreign body? Because you're going to have all of about two minutes to figure it out once they get there. So knowing what tools you have is really important. Knowing what help you're going to get, if you do have help, where are they? Is it the same help at Sunday morning at 3 AM as it is at Tuesday afternoon at 1? You have to know this ahead of time. And where you're going to transfer the child um, is something you need to know as well. So I like simple things. I like little algorithms. Um, so first question we talked about is a single or recurrent. And the recurrent is nice because you can separate it into where you hear the strider and you can pretty much make a diagnosis. Now, of course, there's overlap and everything is classic and nobody presents classically. But this is a good frame of mind, a framework to keep in mind while you're seeing these patients. Inspiratory strider that's recurrent most commonly is laryngomalacia. So the classic story for laryngomalacia is a two-week-old who comes in with noisy breathing. They've had a little bit of noisy breathing. It's worse when the child lays down. It's a, they've otherwise been normal. And you walk in, and the mom's nursing, and you hear this little <coughs> you're like, what is going on with this child? This is what the airway, this is what the epiglottis looks like, a little omega shape. This is actually not terribly uncommon. It's the most common cause of infantile strider. It's because they have a higher larynx, a longer epiglottis, and more cartilaginous laxity, and this thing just flops in front of their airway when they breathe in. It causes a very harsh noise, and if you've ever heard, has anyone seen kids with laryngomalacia? It's very distinctive, their, their little noise making. And it's worse with, with, their, with their activity, which at two weeks is pretty much eating, and when they're lying supine. It is associated with reflux, whether that's the chicken or the egg, nobody really knows. Do you have so much negative intrathoracic pressure because you're, you have strider that you're pulling up your gastric contents? Or does reflux cause chronic inflammation and cartilag more cartilaginous laxity? No one knows. The bottom line is reflux is fairly easy to treat, so we do it. So if you see a kid with laryngomalacia, they're going to end up on ranitidine at some point. I have no problem starting on in children's ED. And then sometimes if you see these kids who've already had this diagnosis, they'll be placed on a PPI if they're refractory to ranitidine. Kids grow out of this, they do fine. So that's really the most common cause of inspiratory strider that's recurrent in infants. So now you think, well, what causes the biphasic? What's around here? Now this is one that could potentially be more serious, but you don't want to get involved with it at the ED. And that's subglottic stenosis, a subglottic hemangioma, or vocal cord paralysis. Vocal cord paralysis is not a huge deal. I didn't make a slide about it because I don't have any fun pictures, and I don't do video of this because it's paralyzed, so it would just be like looking at a still photo. Right? That's a joke. Feel free to laugh if you find this funny. So this is subglottic stenosis. Do you want to innovate this airway? No, 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 no. So subglottic stenosis is not very common, but it, does, it can be congenital or acquired. And just to add to your, your pleasure today, you don't have to have a history of intubation to have subglottic stenosis. So we think about it in the child who's been in the NICU for a long time, but you don't have to have that history. You can still have a stenotic subglottic region. It's associated with reflux, again, probably because of all infants reflux. So you could probably look at any disease process and say, it's associated with reflux. And it become, but it comes acutely worse with URIs. So you can be doing fairly well with a pretty tight airway until you get your first cold. And now you start to have some issues. So this didn't happen overnight, right? This, didn't, this airway didn't suddenly collapse down. So don't rush to do anything to intervene. Don't paralyze this child. Don't sedate this child. Instead, treat the trigger. What is something making it inflamed? Give them some steroids. Maybe they need some racemic epinephrine to decrease the inflammation. Calm the child, treat the pain, treat their, treat their distress. Subglottic hemangioma is another one that you don't want to mess with either. So the, all the pretty little kids who get the hemangioma that grows over the first year of life, well, just for fun, you can get them in, under your vocal cords as well. And they're called subglottic hemangiomas. And just like real hemangiomas, they expand rapidly in the first year of life. Um, they are usually treated with propanolol and corticosteroids, but again, not an airway that you would ever want to get involved with in the emergency department. So, recurrent or progressive, longer-term biphasic strider, 
I wouldn't do I wouldn't be crazy about intervening. So that leads us to our last one, which is expiratory. And these are these are um, sort of my favorite ones. These are tracheomalacia and bronchomalacia, as well as vascular rings. These are pretty rare. So this is tracheomalacia airway. The picture on the left is in, during inspiration. You can see the airway collapse during expiration. The good news is, is that this child is going to be known to have this problem before they even see you. In fact, if they leave the hospital before they're a year of age, that's probably pretty impressive because these kids are, have a lot of other issues. They could be hypotonic. They have other congenital abnormalities. It's obviously a more severe problem if you don't have a patent airway. And it can, it can cause a little bit of inspiratory strider. Just depends on how high your, um, your weakened airway is. Vascular rings are a little bit different. So these kids get missed all the time, and we miss them. Um, they're not common, so I'm not saying that every asthmatic that's, or reactive airway disease has a vascular ring. But we assume they come in with this loud breathing that sounds like a wheeze, right? But it's really expiratory strider. The two things that do that are if your aortic arch, when it develops, wraps around your trachea, or if your pulmonary artery swings around between your trachea and your esophagus. Depending on how much, you, when you present with this problem is going to depend on how severe your constriction is. That makes sense, right? These kids usually present with alties, with feeding dysfunction, especially if it's pushing on the esophagus as well. And this is the kicker. It's non-positional strider. So most strider, if it involves the upper airway, is positional. When the child lays down, the floppy airway collapses. But this is a fixed obstruction down in the chest, so it doesn't matter where they are, they're going to have this, the same strider. These kids are the recurrent asthma that never gets better with albuterol, doesn't respond to steroids. So these are just some of the things that can cause recurrent noisy breathing. And you can see that these aren't things that happened overnight, and thus you're probably not going to have to intervene heroically when they present with issues. Now we get to the single episode. These are the ones that make us a little bit more nervous, right? And I break these into two groups. One is the febrile or infectious, and the other is afebrile, which is essentially a foreign body. So we have to talk about croup because it's the most common cause of noisy breathing, but I'll try to keep it interesting because this is something we see all the time. You can get inflammation anywhere along the airway to have in croup. It could be up in the larynx, it could be down in the trachea or down in the bronchioles. The incidence is really common, right? About one and a half to six percent of all children less than the age of six have had an episode of croup. And the good news is, is that despite the fact that it's really common, but it's actually usually not that bad. Less than 5% of the kids you see are going to end up needing to come into the hospital. Less than 5% of those kids are going to need to be intubated. And less than half a percent of those kids end up dying. So very common disease, but usually not very serious. So, and we all know this story, right? They come in usually around 4 or 5 in the morning. Parents hear a cough, a gasp. They go running into the child's room, frantic. Now child gets frantic. Everybody's frantic. There's crying. There's gasping. Nobody can get air. Everybody runs into the emergency department in their jammies. And by the time they've gone from house to cold air to car to cold air to emergency department, the kid looks great and the parents look ashamed. So we treat that with steroids, right? You only need one dose. You don't need to put them on prednisone for a long period of time. Hopefully we all practice that way. Just 0.6 milligrams per kilo times one. And we give it orally. I never give it I am. And you, but you can minimize the volume, and this is something that um, not everybody does, which is the oral formulation. Who's ever tried this type of steroid by mouth? It's foul tasting. It's horrible. If you've never tried it, do it next time you're working in the emergency department. Steroids make everybody feel better, so just try some. But, the vo but it's really horrid. It's irrelevant what form you give them. It's going to taste equally horrid. So give the IV form in the mouth. It's, you use a quarter of the volume, and you can chase it with a popsicle really fast, and they barely even know they've had it. Now, if they're worse than that, the strider at rest patient, right, they're going to get some racemic epinephrine. And then I'm pretty strict about watching these children. Again, next time you're back up in your hotel room, breathe with strider for about a minute and tell me how uncomfortable you are and how much distress this puts you in. So if you have strider at rest when you see me and I'm worried enough about you to give you epi, I'm watching you for three hours in the ED. I'm not committing you to an admission, but I'm going to make sure you don't have a rebound as that epinephrine wears off. You can redose this as much as you need to. So one question is, well, what if they're still stridulous at rest and I've just given them an epi? If their heart rate can tolerate it, give them another dose. But if they're worse than that, so what if you give that and you're still sitting in the room and the kid's still working and you think it's croup? You can try Heliox if that's available to you. It can be fun. 
It decreases turbulent flow through tight airways. Here's the problem with Heliox, though. One is it's a mask that you have to put on their face, and the whole point of this is to calm the child down, and masks and faces of infants don't usually calm them. And you're limited by your need of oxygen. So if you really need to give them 70% FiO2, now you can only give 30% helium, doesn't really do much for you. This is the most important thing, though. Address the little things. We forget this because we see this kid as sort of anxious looking, mom's anxious, child's anxious, everybody's starting to get a little worked up. Address the little things because this is what will make a huge difference for you. This, is, this group hurts, so treat it. Treat their fever, treat their pain, a little rectal Tylenol. Help them calm down. Keep everybody calm. Keep them hydrated if they can. Higher metabolic load, dehydration, fever, stress, all these things are gonna increase your respiratory rate. All these things are gonna increase your respiratory rate against a fixed obstruction, which is gonna make you more upset. Tracheitis. Now this is someone that we don't think very much about because we always think of croup if we think fever and strider. You know, we don't usually often think about tracheitis, but this is increasing in incidence. Usually has a prodromal URI, just like croup. And then an acute worsening over 24 hours with strider. There's a usually moderate fever involved, and you're gonna to wanna to need to differentiate this from other etiologies, right? Because this is an acute onset respiratory distress with a fever, and you're gonna think, am I the poor son of a gun who sees the one case of epiglottitis in the state right now? Please tell me now. So you wanna be able to differentiate. So they're not gonna drool, right? If you have a big epiglottis, you're probably gonna drool because you can't swallow around that big thing. But kids with tracheitis don't drool. They also don't respond like croup to steroids or epinephrine. They just continue to have this strider, usually biphasic. This is what the inside of an airway looks like with tracheitis on a bronch. It looks gnarly, doesn't it? So it makes sense that they would have stridulous breathing. To manage, they need antibiotics, oxacillin, third generation cephalosporin, or vancomycin. They might need bronchoscopy just to wash all that stuff out of their airway. And younger children, if you had a nine-month-old who has tracheitis, they might end up getting intubated just because they can't handle all the mucus secretions. Beware, if you do intubate a patient who has tracheitis, that um, you might get a lot of mucus plugs. So these children can need to be intubated. It's usually not a difficult intubation because the problem is lower than where you need to be. Just be aware that there's a lot of mucus. So the foreign body, this is my least favorite. So this is the case, a case that we actually had transferred to us, and I spent about an hour on the phone with a community emergency department doctor just sitting there with her basically while she stooled herself over this patient because it was so stressful. 15-month-old comes in with sudden respiratory distress. I would have stooled myself too. I'm not, I'm not done. This was scary. She was playing with her older sister, unobserved with a bowl of peanuts while mom was taking a shower. I've done a lot of dumber things as a mom, so I cast no judgment there. And all of a sudden, she starts crying, and she's in respiratory distress. She's got inspiratory strider. <laughs> and she comes into you, and she's, but she's setting 100% with blow by oxygen. And the doc calls me and says, I, I haven't intubated the child in 10 years. I don't have any backup. I'm sending her to you right now. And I said, well, you, you can't. Because this is a patient who has a really high foreign body. And if you move them, if you lay them down, if you do anything, that foreign body is going to slip into the airway and you're going to have a big problem. And the last place you want that to have happen is on the truck. And this is scary because this is a totally normal, healthy, thriving child who's all of a sudden has a completely terrifying diagnosis. But it's okay. It had a happy ending. Child's fine. Um, foreign body aspirations come, in, in my mind, in three categories. They're the super scary that I never want to see. There's a suspected with physical signs, right? My child was playing, now they've got this wheeze, I, they don't have a fever, everything else has been fine, I don't know what happened. And then my personal favorite, the suspected by history, my child was playing with their 150 Legos, now one is missing, I think they ate it. <laughs> Great. So the super scary, um, inspiratory strider, be very, very uh, cautious about that. But don't forget the simple things, like the Heimlich maneuver. We discussed that. She was like, I don't want to touch this kid. Like, she was, she was very nervous. She was a great doc, and she did a great job, but she, was, she just did not want to upset this job. You could try jaw thrust. Your tools. Do you know where your pediatric McGills are to remove a pediatric foreign body from an airway? These are tiny little airways. Next time you do a throat exam on a nine-month-old or a 15-month-old, look back there and think, what would I do if there was a Lego head sitting back there? If you don't want to use your alligator forceps because they're too sharp. You're going to cause trauma. And the last thing you want with a Lego head is a bleeding oropharynx and a Lego head. It's a bad combination. So you really need to know where these little guys are. 
And then you need to know how you're going to do jet ventilation. Not if you're going to do jet ventilation. Not, oh, I wonder if we do that. Everybody should be able to do jet ventilation. It's not that hard. I'm happy to talk about it at length after this talk. But you have to know what your tools are to do it. Because this is a scenario where jet ventilation saves lives. So then the suspected with physical signs. What else physical signs? Sudden onset respiratory distress. Maybe some strider. Maybe a wheeze or cough. Not relieved by albuterol. We've seen this before. You're going to get an x-ray. Maybe you'll get lucky. Maybe you'll see something. Maybe you won't. But it's irrelevant. Because if you have suspicion for a foreign body and they're making noise, they're going to get a bronch. They need to go somewhere where they can get a bronch. They need to get a bronch. Now, if it's just suspected a Lego is missing, um, then, then what do you do? I get an x-ray. Who knows? You might get lucky. You might see really hyperinflated chest on one side. You might actually see the foreign body. Please, if somebody knows anybody at Lego, ask them if they could please make their pieces radio opaque because so far they have not. And they need close follow-up. Why? Because you want, to make sure, you want to make sure that the parents know, hey, I don't see anything today, but if Johnny gets a fever and a cough, make sure that whoever takes care of him the next time knows that he might have inhaled a Lego, because that will change, change what they do for that for the patient at that point. Complications increase with passing time. So we've talked about the not scary sick, right? And we talked about foreign bodies, and a lot of things can go back and forth between the scary and the not scary with airway problems, right? So let's talk about the really scary sick, the oh no kid that's in your emergency department right now. The first question you have to ask yourself is, do you think this is epiglottitis? Now, epiglottitis, we're talking about here, but it doesn't, shouldn't really cause noisy breathing. Maybe a squeak, but they really don't breathe noisily. Thankfully, because we are all so fantastic about immunizing all of our children, Hib has almost been eradicated as a cause of epiglottitis. And the incidence of epiglottitis has dropped dramatically from 12 to 0.7 in 100,000. So if you're starting to think, I wonder if this is epiglottitis, the first thing you should probably do is think, wait a minute, what else could this be? Because this is probably not epiglottitis. Now it's caused by other bacteria, and adults get it. I don't know, have you, has anyone seen adults lately with have epiglottitis? Right. It's equally as scary, but um, it's, a, it's just changing as a disease process. This is the two to seven year old who comes in and they look terrible and they look terrible fast. They usually have high fever, their throat hurts, they're tripoding, they're sniffing, they're doing anything they can to open up their airway. They are drooling, which is unlike most other causes of Strider. And they actually make little bit, just very little noise. And they do not cough. So if you're trying to think, oh, I wonder if this is tracheitis or epiglottitis, I don't really know, I don't know how I should manage this. If they're coughing, it's probably tracheitis, because epiglottitis usually doesn't cough. So this is the time where we do not want to be the cowboy, right? Unlike the foreign body that's sitting in the molecular space, you do not want to touch these children at all. You don't irritate them. You need to get them to a secure area, which means you need to have the plan before you see the child. So do you know what you would do if you had a child with an airway disaster at 2 o'clock on a Sunday morning? If you don't, it's something to think about when you get back home. You're sort of walking a tightrope, right? You don't want to intervene. You don't want to bother the child. You want to get them someplace quickly. What if something happens on the way? Right? It's, it's a very stressful scenario. Don't forget antibiotics, at the very least. Remember, this is a bacterial infection, so please treat them with antibiotics. And get help. So pediatric ENT, that would be nice. So I work at a children's hospital, right, where I have every subspecialty, 24 hours a day. I think pediatric ENTs are like unicorns. I've never actually seen one. I've never actually even talked to one on the phone. I could talk to their mid-level provider, and they will tell me how to get the patient follow-up, but I've never actually seen one, nor do I have any confidence that I can get one to actually come into our emergency department at 3 o'clock in the morning. Anesthesia, again, this has to be worked out ahead of time. Who am I going to call at whatever hour of the day to help me with this child? And all hands on deck. That doesn't mean this woman, the only person that she had who could help her was a CRNA who came up from anesthesia, and the two of them managed the airway together just to provide moral support. Fantastic. This is, that kids with bad airways are stressful. So you want all hands on deck. And that means your, your RT, getting your nurses. If you don't have a lot of support, get, the, get custodial services to sit with a family. Do, get everybody together. Figure out what would you say to a family if you don't actually know what's going on, and now you're going to try to intubate, and you don't know if it's going to go okay or not. What are you going to say to the parents as you're, as you're having that discussion? Think about this before it happens. If you have to transfer, know where they'll go. So if it's not epiglottitis, you think, OK, whew, they're not sick, but this is probably not epiglottitis, which means they may have a foreign body that I need to go after. I'm going to need to do something. 
be prepared ahead of time. What are the tools that you have at your disposal? Do you have video laryngoscopy at your shop? Do you have the ability to do nasopharyngoscopy? Can you borrow it from the OR? Can I get the little thing with a little camera that I can look down and see what's going on? Do you, how are you going to do transtracheal ventilation? Not if I need to do transtracheal ventilation, because everybody should have, know exactly what they have in their shop to do this if they need to do it. Do you have your pediatric bougie? Do you have LMAs? What other things, adjuncts, do you have at your disposal if this scenario were to occur? And tools for removing a foreign body. So, what do you do for these kids? How do you manage the super scary sick? Or even though not super scary sick, I can't emphasize this enough. Think about this before the child hits your door. Two, remember that upset infants, like upset ED physicians, constrict their airways when they're sobbing over something, right? When next time you're crying, just remember, <coughs> it, you constrict when you're upset. So make them not upset anymore. And that's fever control, pain control, and calm. One of the reasons why pa babies always look better in the emergency department than they do when they were at home is that moms relax when they're in the emergency department, once they're done yelling at you for their weight. They're, they're pretty relaxed, and babies sense that. Babies are fairly manipulative little creatures. They know how to get what they need, and they, they know how to read their parents very carefully. So if mom's stressed and anxious, baby's stressed and anxious. Mom's calm, baby's calm. So make sure, don't underestimate the importance of that, because upper airway noise and constriction needs, everybody needs to be calm and pain-free. And remember your non-invasive therapies in these children. Steroids, even if it's a structural problem, something irritated it today. So give them some steroids, give them some racemic epinephrine, think about heliox. So this is a diagnosis that you can make a lot with just your history and physical. You don't need a lot of tests. Oops, sorry. Not all that strider is croup. There are other fun infections that can cause noisy airways. Make sure you have a strategy for your ONO scenario before it happens and don't ever manage the scary alone. Doesn't, even if you just have to phone a friend and have them on speaker while you manage this. The algorithm of um, the Emily's management of Strider is in, the, in your slides if you need it. Thank you very much. <laughs>